Welcome back to our podcast of Hearing Her Voice. My name is Scarlett, and I'm the president of Women's March San Diego at UCSD. As usual, I'm here with my co-host, Jin Ho. Hi, everyone. So um, today we are going to talk about um, space. Jin Ho, have you ever thought about going to space? I think I did, and like probably when I was watching Star Wars back in the days. I thought about going to space and then just the thought about gravity, like zero gravity was pretty interesting, but I realized I would not be able to survive in like a like a closed space. That's why I kind of dropped my dream of being an astronaut when I was seven, I believe. But yeah, how about you? <laughs> Aw, seven is super young. Um, me, I actually was always super into planets and my favorite planet was Pluto, but then, you know, they kind of took it off. Kicked them out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, I don't know, slowly, uh, I just, I just, you know, it just went away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as I grew up, I kind of got more scared because I would see all these like movies and how these astronauts were in space and then everything would go bad. And I just, you know, I was like, oh no, I would not be able to do this. Yeah, the gravity um, was kind of intense. Do you remember the movie with Sandra Bullock on it? Yeah, yeah. I, it uh -huh. was like, it was literally kind of like, I know what's <laughs> going to happen. And you know how everything happens like super slow? I'm like, okay, come oh, on, yeah. let's go. Let's oh, go. Yeah. Like, I want to like push her, you know? I'm like to safety or something. I don't know. Uh -huh. But yeah, so that that's when I kind of... But I would say that, you know, working for NASA, is has always been like a whoa kind of thing you know i think as a little girl i always thought that that would be kind of impossible um i don't know coming from my background you know like none of my family like was educated i was like mm -hmm. first to go to college um and i just i it, to me it was like somebody has to be like a genius you know and then i was like i can only pick one out of everything um and i was like okay so I was like, oh, there's teacher, doctor, astronaut, there's attorney, there's all of these professors, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I can only pick one, but turns out, you know, you can pick more than one. So apparently um, you can also be an engineer, a doctor, and an astronaut all at the same time. Oh, wait, wait, like, that's like the hardest thing in the world, though, like being a physician, I mean, as a pre-med, like, it's really hard to get into medical school and engineering is just notorious to, you know, graduate and like being an astronaut, like, you know, going to NASA and everything like that's like, like, for example, if you say you're a NASA engineer or like you've worked for NASA, then like, you don't really see those people in real life. Not only that, you know but you could also be a scientist doing research in space. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. Do you know anybody? Yes, her name is Serena Onion Chancellor. So Serena is uh, a graduated um, from undergrad as an engineer and she went to medical school and um, she does space medicine and works with NASA. She's an astronaut, has been in space, and she goes up there just to do research so that, you know, um, we can be able to find um, an advancement in science for cancer to be able to help patients with cancer as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, so I honestly think she is super awesome. She honestly did not settle for just one thing she was like no i am going to be mm -hmm. this and that so we were actually able to partner up with latin health connections and ucsd medical school and we had a talk with her let's tune in so again my name is uh, serena Almion chancellor and I'm going to talk to you today, talk to you a little bit about aerospace medicine, because it's not a well-known field. And, you know, you have a space medicine interest group there at UCSD, and it's, uh, you know, aerospace and space medicine, they, they're all one of the same family. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then actually, how does medicine even work on board the ISS? So I'll 
uh, briefly talk about human spaceflight physiology and some of the things that we worry about as far as acute medical emergencies. As far as myself, I currently work for three entities. So I am still a member of the astronaut corps. Uh, I am a, an associate professor of clinical medicine at LSU Health, actually in Baton Rouge as part of an internal medicine residency program. I love to teach. Uh, I just came off the inpatient ward service yesterday. It was two weeks, it was pretty tiring, but I love being around residents and students. Uh, it's, it's really one of my main loves. And I'm also one of the associate program directors for the aerospace medicine residency program at UTMB in Galveston, Texas. So just depends on what day of the week as to which hat I'm wearing, but I love everything that I do. Um, and so it's a joy. Like I mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about my career path and how I got to where I am today. Cause I know some of you are interested in that. We'll talk a little bit about aerospace medicine in general and the human response to spaceflight in the physiology realm. Uh, really, when you talk about space flight physiology, you're looking at a week to two week long course. So you're gonna get a very mini crash course and then you know, we can set up further lectures in the future to, to kind of go more in depth about that. We just announced a new astronaut class yesterday, the class of 2021. So I'll talk about training and how we prepare for space flight. And then finally, the art of medicine on board the ISS. So my background, is, as Shivani mentioned, I did receive my Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the George Washington University. Uh, when I first entered the engineering realm, I was not pre-med. Uh, in fact, I went pre-med fairly late in between my sophomore and junior year. Uh, and it was just something that I felt I needed to do. And um, after a lot of consultation with friends and advisors and family, um, I made the decision to go pre-med. Uh, when I was in medical school at UT Houston, which is now McGovern Medical School, <clears throat> I learned about a clerkship that is still offered twice a year by the Johnson Space Center in April and October. It's virtual right now because of COVID, normally held in person, but it talked about aerospace medicine because I knew at that time I wanted to work for NASA as a physician and I just didn't know how. So I went ahead and applied to this clerkship and got in, and that's where I learned about the residency program that I did eventually enter into at UTMB it was a combined internal medicine and aerospace medicine residency program, which we still offer. In fact, we're interviewing right now for slots. Um, when I entered into that residency, it's actually a four year combined residency where you end up being board certified in both and you receive your master's of public health degree. I loved internal medicine so much that I split those two residencies out and did a traditional three year residency in internal medicine and an additional year as chief resident and then two years as an aerospace medicine resident and started off as a flight surgeon at Johnson Space Center. And many people don't know what a flight surgeon is or what they do, but flight surgeon is an expert in aerospace medicine. And so aerospace medicine, you're looking at the study and treatment of, disor of disorders associated with flight, especially space flight. Our program at UTMB in Galveston is funded by NASA. They need physicians to be trained to look after the astronaut corps and their families in a wide variety of environments. So the hypo and hyperbaric environment, high G forces, and specifically the reduced gravity environment. However, aerospace does encompass a lot of other extreme environments such as polar or desert environment. And so the way I explain it to people is internal medicine, you have a normal environment abnormal body. But aerospace medicine, you have a normal body, you're putting into an abnormal environment. Now, I kind of have to change my definition because you've got companies, and we'll talk about this, commercial spaceflight companies like Blue Origin, who are launching Captain Kirk, launching people much older who have multiple medical comorbidities, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, you name it. The core, the ast professional astronaut core, is pretty well screened. We're pretty healthy by the time we fly. We have issues medically, but not like some of these folks who are launching now with commercial space flight. So really aerospace medicine has suddenly become more difficult than it was in the past. Humans love to explore and they wanna be on the top of Everest in Antarctica in the desert running an ultra marathon or under the sea. And the body itself, believe it or not, is beautifully adaptable. 
and does very, very well in most of these environments, but we walk a fine line. And so you need a group of physicians who are able to understand that line, understand the hyperbaric environment, understand extreme cold, high altitude, and all the physiological changes that come along with that, especially in the environment of space. On board the International Space Station, we sit at Earth's atmosphere. Pressure, everything is normal. Percent oxygen that we breathe, exactly the same. What's different is the microgravity environment and that changes everything inside the body. So if you look at becoming an aerospace medicine specialist, there are many opportunities out there to do this. In fact, in the past six months, I've heard from multiple institutions that would like to start in aerospace medicine, an ACGME accredited program to be able to train residents. And I really encourage them to do that because with the advent of commercial spaceflight and more companies out there, we need more specialists who are trained the right way. Overseas as well, um, you see many training programs. The great thing about aerospace medicine, it is a very small family. We all know each other and we all try to help each other out. Um, and this family is growing by necessity, which is really cool. So where do aerospace medicine specialists work? The majority of our residents that come out at UTMB go work for NASA. Now, more recently in the last two to three years, we've had two or three go work for commercial space flight. In fact, if you look at the chief medical officers for SpaceX, Virgin Galactic and Axiom all came from the UTMB program. And many of the flight surgeons were working under them came from UTMB. Several of our residents though, choose to go work for the FAA or the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, to work on accident investigation boards. Some become private aviation medical examiners who examine commercial airline pilots, Southwest, United, American Airlines, or your private pilots that hold second and third class certificates and fly all over. Several work in an academic setting. So there really are a lot of options. Um, and like I mentioned before, we need to train more people uh, our biggest issue right now is we're actually not putting out enough people. And that's what makes aerospace medicine interesting in that there are not many programs that exist throughout the United States. And I would love to see more pop up within universities. <clears throat> no kidding, just yesterday, NASA announced its newest astronaut class in 2021, for 2021. Um, the gentleman right in the middle, Dr. Anil Menon was actually a UTMB aerospace medicine grad. He is the current chief medical officer at SpaceX. <laughs> so SpaceX is gonna be losing him and he is being pulled over to NASA. So now we've got to figure out who replaces him over there at SpaceX. But this is a wonderful group of people, very excited to get these folks started. Um, they are all bright eyed and bushy tailed and it's all smiles because the training hasn't started yet. Um, but it's always fun to have a new class. We have an astronaut selection about every four years used to be much more frequent than that. It used to be every one to two years because we were flying people at such a fast rate on the shuttle. But the shuttle retired in 2012. And so flying people to and from the International Space Station doesn't happen as frequently. And we'll talk a little bit about that. This was my class. This is the class of 2009. Every class has a nickname or a name of flightless creature. So the new class of 2021 will be named by the class before them in a very special ceremony. So the class before us, the 2004 class, actually gave us the name, the Chumps. Uh, again, a flightless creature. But what a wide mix of specialties. So NASA doesn't, you know, they hire people for a multitude of reasons, but they don't hire doctors to be doctors on the ISS. Or they don't hire chemical engineers because they have a special chemical engineering task on the ISS they want them to accomplish. They hire people with a variety of backgrounds, hopefully a pretty good personality that work well together in a team and then train them equally across the board to accomplish the mission. So we're all trained the same in spacewalks, in robotics, in ISS systems. But if you look at all of our backgrounds, you have everything from Air Force test pilots to Navy test pilots. Uh, the gentleman all the way in the right, on the right in the front uh, Colonel Mark Vandehei is an Army combat engineer. He is on board ISS right now for a year. And he didn't find out really till right before he launched that he was going for a year. So um, 
you may recognize some of these other people. Um, the doctor to my, I guess, standing to my left, but to your right, Dr. Kate Rubens. She owned her own lab at the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Jeanette Epps, Dr. Jeanette Epps, who was standing on the other side of Kate, was actually an aerospace engineer for Ford Motor, and she actually worked for the CIA for some time. But there's such a wide variety of backgrounds. So we all came in as a class in 2009 and began our training. So this, and <laughs> I realize some of you are probably too young to recognize who this is, and I'm dating myself, but some of you older folks out there know who that is. That is Dr. McCoy. That is Beverly Crusher. And then of course, that is a younger Dr. McCoy. So if, if any of you have seen the Star Trek movies, um, you know, in the movies, in the media, it's always portrayed that on board a space mission, you have a physician, which absolutely makes sense. If you're on an exploration class mission, like Star Trek NCC 1701, you're gonna have a physician with you in a full staff. Um, a lot of people believe I flew to the space station to be the physician, and that's actually not the case. NASA was happy to have a physician up there in case something happened, but my main job on board ISS was science and maintenance and repair, just like everybody else. We don't have a physician on board the ISS at all times. Only about 10 to 15% of the astronaut corps are physicians. So it's, um, now will the change as we head back to the moon and, and push on towards Mars? Very likely. Would you need a physician on a three year long mission? Probably a good idea. What type of physician would you wanna bring? Or would you wanna expand the skill sets of the person that maybe also was an excellent engineer? Maybe think of someone like in the Martian, someone who's can multitask, perform a variety of different repairs and everything autonomously on their own if they need to. <clears throat> so the space station, if you haven't seen it fly overhead, you should. It's amazing. It's one of the brightest objects in the night sky and it's moving fast. So orbital velocity, 17,500 miles an hour. It's a big structure. People, a lot of the question I get a lot of times is, did you feel crowded up there, cramped? Absolutely not. This thing internally is the size of a five bedroom house. And there were several days where I was working in a glove box, a science glove box. And so I'm kind of locked in because I've got a microphone on and my hands in and I've got my hands in science and I needed something. And I look to my right and I look to my left and there's nobody, I can't see any of the other five people who are working around me to get me a piece of equipment to shove it in one of the side doors. And I just remember thinking, this is surreal. I mean, it's big, but we're not that big. Where the heck is everybody? So again, plenty of room on board this space station, plenty of living compartments. Now, you know, our little crew quarters, we each get our own little crew quarter. It's about the size of a phone booth. and if. Again, you're too young to, to know how big that is. Well, too bad, but essentially you can fit a couple laptops in there. We have a sleeping bag that is actually tacked against the wall. And we can talk about how sleeping works in microgravity. And I'd have pictures of my family and my animals. And I apologize if you hear my dog snoring behind me because she is snoring, but she always is with me when I give presentations. So when you enter into the astronaut corps like that, brand new class of 2021 I just showed you. The first two years are astronaut candidate training. You're not training for a mission right away. So you're learning how to just be an astronaut and you learn, you fly in the T-38 training jet, you get into the neutral buoyancy lab and begin to learn how to do spacewalks and how to operate in a suit. You begin to learn ISS systems. And that takes anywhere again from two to three years. And then you are qualified to be assigned to spaceflight. And then you wait for your turn to get assigned and you don't know when that's coming and you don't know where you stand in line. But you get a call from the chief of the astronaut office and the current chief is actually a classmate of mine. His name is Breed Wiseman. And they'll give you a call and say, I got a flight for you. Well, once you get assigned, it's not like you launch next, next week. It's funny how many of my friends thought that was gonna happen. It's another two to three years for you to prepare. Sometimes shorter, just depends on the need. But again, you're trained on all the ISS systems the electrical power system, environmental control system, how to repair these systems, how to work malfunctions in these systems, robotics. Remember robotics is how we pull in our cargo vehicles. All those cargo vehicles that drop off critical supplies to ISS don't dock themselves. They hover about 30 meters outside of station and we have to use a robot arm 
to grapple it, which sounds simple. It's one of the most difficult things you'll ever do. You train a lot away from home. So during my training flow, I was probably gone from home 60% of the time over a two year period. It's difficult. You're away from family a lot. And you launch and land from Kazakhstan, really the middle of the desert where there are a lot of camels. And I, I distinctly remember being on the bus heading to the launch pad and seeing all the camels along the train track. It was surreal. This is what I launched in. Now we launch in more vehicles now, US vehicles, but I launched in a Russian, the Soyuz vehicle, extremely reliable vehicle. Um, where the crew sits is that middle compartment. You can see the window there. That is the descent capsule. And the upper compartment to, to the left of that is the bayo, uh, which means something in Russian, but it's basically a habitation module. And we took a two ride, two day ride to station. We try to get there faster now. The Russians have adapted their orbital maneuvers to be able to get to station almost in four hours. But when we launched, two day ride. So it's like two days in a very tiny tent with two of your friends. Always an international crew. Um, Tom Marshburn, the gentleman in the center is actually on board station right now. He's another astronaut physician. Um, he's an emergency medicine doc. To his right is Chris Hadfield, a Canadian, and to his left, well, I guess to our left would be Roman Romanenka. You can see the name tags there on the Soyuz suit. Ideally, this is the relationship you want your crew to have before you launch. You wanna be great friends. And ideally, since you've been training together for two and a half years and everybody spent time with each other's families, it's exactly what happens. Um, this is important to build that camaraderie prior to launching. This is the crew on orbit right now. Mark Van de Heys, I mentioned all the way to the right is the chump class. We have a mixture of multiple countries here, the United States, Germany, and Russia. This is Expedition 66. And you can tell they modeled their expedition patch after the infamous Route 66. But everybody gets to take part in designing the patch. So it's, kind of, it's a lot of fun to do that. And these folks just completed a spacewalk. Tom Marshburn, second from the left, was the lead. Kayla Barron, second from the right, was what we call EV2. So she was the assistant during that spacewalk and they replaced critical antennas on board the space station just about a few days ago. So when you train in the US, sort of like I mentioned, we do very long training runs in the neutral buoyancy lab to practice spacewalks. We are really focused on system failures. What is gonna take the vehicle out? What could hurt you? ISS emergencies, fire, toxic atmosphere, depressurization events. We spend hundreds of hours doing robotics training to make sure we capture those cargo vehicles because you are under, under the gun um, and you have about 90 seconds. So it's almost like performing or playing the most difficult video game of your life with multiple degrees of freedom, two different hand controllers to capture those cargo vehicles. We are really trained very well on paying very close attention to detail. Very similar to medicine, actually. A lot of people think we spend a lot of time training on the science prior to launching. And in truth, I probably learned about 80% of the science I was going to complete on ISS once I got up there, which stunned me. But we do a really nice job with what we call on the job training. We focus a lot on behavior. And this is important. I've actually developed another lecture called Lessons in Leadership from ISS that I have given to my residents at LSU. It talks about something called expeditionary behavior because it talks about how you look after yourself and how you look after your team and all the different permutations that come along with that. Because when you're in the field of medicine, especially residency training or medical school, don't be fooled. It's an expedition. And you have to pay attention to behavior at all times because at all times, your behavior impacts others and impacts the team, and impacts patient care, and impacts research, impacts large groups. And so there are so many lessons that I learned along the way during training and even on orbit that I still use today in medicine. You operate in a fishbowl. So residents, students who are out there listening to this lecture, you feel like you're being watched and graded all the time. Welcome to NASA. 
when you're an astronaut, not only are you being watched and graded all the time, but watched and graded from multiple countries. So if you do a training event and it doesn't go well, people know so fast because email is that fast. And you just learn to live like that. It becomes the norm for you, especially when you're on board ISS. We train in a lot of analog environments. What do I mean by that? We put people in very stressful, uncomfortable environments so that you learn how to deal with anxiety. You learn how to perform tasks under stress. It's very easy to get things done when you're well rested and you have your latte in your hand and you're just kind of hanging out. But when you're cold and at the South Pole, like I was there, and being asked to perform tasks to a very fine level of detail, it gets much harder. When you're under the sea and completely saturated for two weeks, living in a 90% humidity environment where attention to detail matters, it's more stressful to get things done. And when you're in the neutral buoyancy lab in a suit that really isn't made very well for a human and it hurts physically, to do things and you're constantly watching your thermal load to make sure you don't get too overheated during a run, it makes things much harder. And the thought behind this is, before we send people onto orbit, we wanna make them as uncomfortable as possible during training so that being uncomfortable is like a close friend that you've met before and it doesn't scare you as much when you have to do something very important in a high stakes environment. So I talked to my residents about this because there are times you're made uncomfortable, students as well, in training, and that is on purpose so that you can make those decisions under fire. So I love analog environments and these are not the only ones that we use. These are the ones I had the, the great fortune to take part in. The Russians have exactly the same philosophy. The Russians, if you had to ask them what their training motto is, it's, the more cuts you receive in training, the less you bleed in the war. And so their philosophy is the more uncomfortable we can make you running your procedures. And what you see here are three crew members with no kidding gas masks on that are actually functional running through a fire scenario with smoke and everything. And let me tell you how hot that mask is and how your visor fogs over and you can't read the procedures and you're not breathing very well and you're doing your best and you begin to overheat, but you have to get things done to protect the vehicle and protect lives. That matters. It matters because if you don't ever make yourself uncomfortable before you launch and then the real thing happens on orbit, you're not gonna be prepared. One other thing the Russians love to do is they, your suit is made exactly for you. It is sewn to your dimensions and they put you in a vacuum chamber about six months prior to launch because in the Russian's mind, your suit will protect you at all costs, even at 106,000 feet. So pretty much near vacuum, vacuum essentially. But during this training event, your suit pressurizes to what it needs to pressurize to. And there's a, what you don't see is a little window in that vacuum chamber. And there's a Russian scientist that stands there and he looks at you and he says, do you trust your suit? Do you trust that it will protect you even if the vehicle loses all pressure? And you turn and look at them and say, uh-huh, bring me back down. <laughs> they bring you back down. <laughs> That's how it works. This is the day before launch. Um, our commander of the Soyuz, Sergei Prokopiev, is in the center seat. Alex Gers from the European Space Agency is all the way to the right. This is our final fit check of the vehicle where we make sure everything is in place. That is how cramped we are. Those bags that you see between all the crew members' heads are emergency equipment, actually, held down with orange straps. Once we close that hatch that you see in front of Sergei, we actually have a little bit more room, but not a lot. And when we're lying back in our seats, we actually, I cannot turn my head and see my other two crewmates, which is why we have mirrors, wrist mirrors on our suits so I can angle them and see my crewmates if I need to. But we have calm, of course. You see our Snoopy caps on and we have complete calm the entire time. Human response to spaceflight. Again, this could be a two week course. Um, there are a lot of courses out there where folks talk about this. Um, some of those organ systems you see, I have asterisk, you have a little bit of an asterisk by, and, and that's because one thing you think about with the human response to spaceflight, especially after six to 
six months to 12 months in space, you wonder what may impact you when you land. What could be a direct impact to maybe you escaping a vehicle that's on fire or a vehicle that didn't land well. And those four organ systems definitely play a role. Um, you know, for me, I lost a significant amount of bone mineral density in my hip and lumbar spine, even with the countermeasures we have on orbit, um, which, you know, are extensive. We do a really good job and ISS is like a castle. We have so much room. We have massive pieces of equipment to essentially lift weights. And every crew member does lift weights every day for an hour and a half. And we run, and we get our aerobic conditioning in. We either run on a treadmill where we are weighted down with bungee cords or we're on an exercise bike. These are big pieces of equipment that we can afford to have on board the ISS. Think about going to Mars. We're not gonna have those. We're not gonna have anything close to that. So we are very, very spoiled in low earth orbit because we have pretty good countermeasures for a good portion of this physiology and all the physiological changes that occur. One thing we don't have good countermeasures toward, however, and that's why I have it in red, is neurovestibular. In fact, if you were to ask me post landing, what was the one organ system which really impeded my function the most and it was neurovestibular. It's not that I couldn't stand because I didn't have enough strength or my bones were so brittle you know, from a disuse osteoporosis standpoint that, you know, I was at high risk of fracture. My cardiovascular system was pretty good. It was neurovestibular. I could, any direction I turned my head and I was essentially tumbling in that direction. So maintaining balance, upright posture was very, very difficult for me the first 24 to 36 hours. I could do it, I could get up, but not without feeling pretty sick very quickly. Crew members have varying degrees of responses to this. Some people can leap out of the capsule and it's no problem. Others you see are very careful not to turn their head too quickly. They keep themselves very static and just very um, deliberate with motions. So you think about a trip to Mars, much longer a trip out and trip back. And where will we be then? Those are the interesting questions I'd like to have answered. Fluid shift in your space flight is huge. Um, Peggy Whitson, she was the first uh, woman commander on board ISS. You see a picture of her on the ground on the left and then how puffy she looks on the right. All of us look like this. You get a massive fluid shift, you know, towards the head. Crew members tend to sound very nasal. Um, and it's one of these things you sort of get used to. It does equilibrate after a while, but where this becomes interesting is you know, on Earth, when we talk about development of DVTs, you know, we look at the gravity dependent areas, the legs, that's where we tend to see them, lower extremity DVT. On space, we consider the lower extremities almost now to be up in the neck. That's where we see that stasis of blood flow. That's where Virchow's triad comes in and you've got a low pressure system now all of a sudden dealing with an increased volume that it hasn't had to deal with before and doesn't have the same gravity drainage that it has. And so now we are seeing DVTs up towards the neck in the internal jugular vein. So this is another, you know, part of spaceflight physiology that you have to understand and we're trying to figure out how to mitigate. So a lot of times I ask, which the first question I answered for y'all, does each crew on ISS have a physician? The answer is absolutely not. So what happens is that there's not a physician, they will pick one or two other crew members to be crew medical officers. And they'll get about a month's worth of training. You think they get a lot more, but training time is critical and always precious. They'll get about a month's worth and they're trained up to an EMT level. So this is Victor Glover. He's a Navy test pilot. Just recently flew on, on crew one on Dragon. Landed not that long ago. And he's practicing suturing. So we take folks into the hospital, into the trauma rooms, into the ER. We teach folks how to do blood draws, including self draws, so we can actually draw our own blood. Now, I will say that when I was on orbit, anytime we had a blood draw, I always had a buddy. Uh, we did use butterfly needles, and, and really the tubing in the butterfly needle was a little short for me to do a self draw. So we always helped each other out because we knew how important the blood draw was for science. We're taught how to place IVs, fully catheters, how to give not only IM, but sub Q injections. We learn how to place an interosseous device. 
if needed, and we have it on orbit. How to do a cricothyrotomy if needed. Thank God, knock on wood, we've never had to do that or perform ACLS, but we do have the capability. The one thing that is our friend that we use all the time on board the ISS for both medical and research needs is ultrasound. And we get really, really good at ultrasound. Every crew member, not just the physicians. And I'll show you a good video of that in a little bit. So what medical conditions do we see? Very common, the first few days you're on orbit, we have the space adaptation syndrome. Really just a malaise, nausea, vomiting, headache is very frequent. Um, you know, Neurovestibular wise, turning your head too rapidly and it just takes a while almost for your brain to catch up. Um, you get disoriented very easily on board ISS because now there is, really is no up, there is no down, you're operating in 3D and then your brain adapts beautifully. And I mean beautifully. A lot of musculoskeletal injuries because you're kind of flying around corners and if you're not careful with your momentum, the mass is still there. And so um, you will see just, you know, essentially flying into things. We are very ungraceful ballerinas when we first get up there and then we get better over time. Minor trauma that comes along with that. Burns. You think about burns. What that doesn't make, are you burning yourself on a hot surface or we have hot water up there that we use to make a variety of things, coffee, tea, soups, all of our food, you know, is, most of it's freeze dried. So we're adding hot water to heat it up and mix it up. And even if small droplets escape from the water spigot, which we're pretty good, the Russian water spigot's a little messier. We get larger blobs there. If, a, if that hot water hits your face, like it did to one of my crew members, surface tension forces dominate up there. So unlike here, where if water hits you, it quickly falls to the ground. Up there, it sticks and it burns and it continues to burn until you actively wipe that fluid away. So it's just a property of, of microgravity itself and how fluids act. I've seen Tabasco go in people's eyes, not pleasant, in people's ears, foreign objects, everything floats up there. So you've got any sort of debris, even from a crumbly cookie, you never know, you could inhale it. So these are things that you just don't think about because the environment changes. We have a tremendous medical suite on board the space station. Why? Because we have the space. So we have everything from suturing kits to multiple types of oral and IV medication. The lady in the picture, she is holding our ACLS kit. Can we run a code in microgravity? Yes, we can, not for very long. We don't have that many rounds, but we do have a defibrillator. We have a separate physician kit if you happen to have a physician up there. So all those kits take up space. It's mass, it's volume, it's constant resupply. And that's again, we're spoiled in low earth orbit. How do we do that on the way to Mars? So this is a video actually of where we do our ultrasound. Um, this is the Columbus module, and which is built by the European Space Agency. And that very colorful laptop you see in front of me is our ultrasound device. Obviously, we can't take something this big with us to Mars, so we'd probably use something like a butterfly probe with some sort of tablet or you know, phone type of interface. But that blue thing in my in my right hand is how I talk to the ground. What you don't see are the cameras that are pointing above my head and of course at me, the one that's filming right now because um, we're about to do some ultrasound screening of our neck to look for DVTs. And so I'm talking to Ashat Sargsyan, who's one of our radiologists on the ground. So he's going to help me by remote guidance. And I said, uh oh, hold on. I forgot the probe. I forgot to hook up the probe. So I'm, I've been up on orbit now for about five months. And so I'm pretty adept at, at performing duties like this. So um, you know, by the time you watch as I pull out these probes and everything, um, I kind of let it escape behind me. And, you know, that's, you have to be very careful in microgravity. If you let things go, they will float away faster than anything and head towards the nearest ventilation source. So um, you see me um, pulling out the probe and it starts to float, but I've gotten pretty good at this point. So I quickly know where that thing is going. It's like a little serpent. And I turn my head to the left and I grab it and hook it up. So I'm getting everything set up and then you're gonna see my crewmate Alex come in. I'm gonna call for him. Alex. 
I think Alex was in the Japanese module. He was waiting for stuff to be finished and then he was gonna fly in and, and help me out. When we do ultrasound on orbit, um, you don't need gel. I like to use gel, but water works great. Again, surface tension, it just sticks to the ultrasounds, the probe head. And you can do, we ultrasound our eyes, we ultrasound our, you know, again, our internal jugular veins, everything. Um, I love to use gel though. I think it's the physician in me. I'm so used to using gel on earth. I couldn't imagine using anything else. So what Alex is going to help me do is I'm going to perform the ultrasound. All right. All right. Here we go. And he is going to take pictures and push buttons and record video because I can't do all three things at one time. So, but notice how we have to tie ourselves down. We hold ourselves down with bungee straps. A lot of this is just restraint. You see how the, the gel is just sitting upright, kind of straight up on the probe. I use kind of an obscene amount of gel, but that's okay. The, I think the video is just froze for the last 30 seconds. We saw. Oh, most, did it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just just the, Sorry about that. Hopefully, just the part where you started the ultrasound. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, hopefully y'all saw that, but. You know, the way we interact with physicians on the ground, did, did that slide advance, Siobhan? Did we get to the next slide okay? We're still on the frozen video slide. Hmm, okay. Okay. Let me know when it advances, because I'm now advanced to the next slide. Can you try to unshare and share again? Yeah, let me do that. One second. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Let me come here. I'm going to share again. OK, can you hear me OK? Yes. And which slide do you see? The screen is black now, so we don't see anything. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't tell you what's happening. Um, it says it's still sharing. Let me, let me stop sharing again. Yeah, let's try it one more time. Okay, one second. All right, let me share screen. I'll try this again. Okay, what do you see now? We we don't see anything, but actually, can you send it to one of us and we can just also try and project it? Or can you send it to... The file's too big. Okay. It's a, it won't go by email. But let me... Um, let me do this. I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to close out the file and bring it back up, okay? And just give me a second here. I'll try and reload it. We're actually almost, almost to the end. We only have about five more slides, but let's try this. Okay, and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna share again. How about now? We're, yeah, we're still not able to see it. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on then. But if you're willing, you can still talk, talk us through the rest of the slides and- Sure, yeah, there's only five slides left actually. Okay. We're only three. Um, Cause I really wanted to, I only kept it to about 30 to 35 slides just so I could allow folks to, to answer some questions, you know, to be able to ask questions if they'd like. Um, so the last few things I talk about are what we call the big three ISS emergencies, because people say, you know, hey, what medical conditions do you think might suddenly occur up there? You know, what about an, an MI or pneumonia? Could that suddenly appear? And, and, and sure, those things are, it's, we're capable of handling those. We try to screen and, and minimize our medical risk with a lot of different areas as much as possible. 
What I worry about is something happening to the vehicle causing illness in the human. Um, and so for me, I worry about fire, a depressing the atmosphere of the vehicle or a toxic atmosphere that remember the ISS is cooled by 100% anhydrous ammonia, nasty, nasty stuff. So if we were to have a failure in any of those systems, that is what's going to impact the human and cause injury or illness. So again, it's an occupational exposure that we worry about. Other things to consider, we don't, you know, in the hospital, in the clinic where you guys are right now, or even the research laboratory, you pretty much have unlimited consumables, things you don't think about running out of in the hospital, syringes, needles, gauze. We are always thinking about and keeping tally of up there. Um, you know, could we actually intubate somebody successfully on orbit if we had to? Yeah, I think we could. Could we keep them sedated for a long period of time and, and, functioning well on a very, very simple ventilator. Um, I don't know, we could. Can we defibrillate on board ISS? Yes, we have a defibrillator and we have to electrically isolate that person before we do it. Um, what about, you know, if you have a medical emergency, can you just evacuate ISS? Well, of course you would if, if it turns out we could not fix what we needed to fix up there. Um, we would bring that person back down. Understand though, leaving ISS is a billion dollar decision, right? When you abandon station, even if you need to for an illness, you're gonna do it, but there are several downstream effects. It is not that easy to just leave station with nobody on it. And I think, tell you what, it's giving me problems now. Hold on, here we go. You still can't see any slides, is that right? Yeah, we can't see any slides. Okay, <laughs> let me just tell you what. We'll, uh, the last two slides I end with are always about what are our main challenges as we head back to the moon and Mars. And so for Mars, you worry, one of the biggest challenges we have right now is space radiation. How does that impact the human? How do we determine what the clinical effects are on the human when most of our research is done on animal models? Continued bone density loss, immune system effects, neurocognitive effects. How do we perform resupply? How on earth do we keep our pharmaceuticals stable for three years? Is that even possible? What behavioral issues are going to pop up? Don't think they won't. They will. So this is part of the reason we go to the moon first. So we have something that's close to home where we can develop robust engineering hardware and test out a lot of these systems before heading off towards Mars. All right, so with that, um, I think it's about, uh, yeah, it's about, I'm right on time. I like to leave, again, time open for folks to ask plenty of, of questions. Sorry you missed the last four or five slides, but I think we got through most of it. Um, so I am gonna stop sharing here. And I think we're good. Uh, let's see, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, perfect. All right, well, if, if I'm happy, if folks wanna turn on their cameras, turn on your camera. I love to see faces um, just because otherwise I'm talking to a blank screen. It's so boring and I really love to see people. It's much cooler. Um, hello, thanks for waving everybody, great. Um, and please, if anybody has a question, Shivani, how did you wanna do this? Did you want people to just uh, ask stuff outright or post in the chat? How do you wanna run it? Yeah, so um, anyone who wants to ask a question can just unmute themselves and ask a question. And then if not, if you want to just type in the chat, we can do that and I can relay the question for you. And thank you again for such a great talk. I know we're all sure. so excited to have you here. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Um, uh, my name's Justine. I really enjoyed your talk. It was really awesome hearing your story. Um, one of the points that you brought up about just the um, physical fitness that's required to go to space for long periods of time. Um, I'm just curious um, what your opinion is on some of these commercial space flight companies that are trying to go to Mars and send up um, uh, very wealthy people that might not always be in such physical fitness. Um, I just wanted to personally, my sister actually works for Blue Origin. So we actually talk about this quite a bit. So um, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on that. 
What a great lead off question. Um, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Justine. It's, uh, I think it's wonderful actually what Blue Origin and SpaceX, especially and Virgin Galactic, you got to look at all three of those companies are doing with launching people. Um, these missions are short. So right now Blue Origin's missions are minutes long, right? So you can almost, I mean, you can even send up 90 year old Captain Kirk for 12 minutes. He's probably gonna make it. Um, things we worry about launching landing forces, vibration, thermal load, you know, if your vehicle's working pretty well, you're going to be successful. Now, at some point, you're going to run into an issue with somebody. I think the longer and longer the mission gets, the more sending up um, novice space flight, you know, novice space flight flyers with very little training, it's the more dangerous it gets. So, you know, Elon Musk is planning on, uh, actually, there's a launch in Russia tomorrow of two Japanese space tourists. Um, the billionaire space tourist, Yusuku Maizawa, is he is launching along with a colleague and a Russian cosmonaut in the center seat to the ISS for 12 days. And then Elon Musk plans on launching him and eight of his friends around a mission to the moon in 2024. I would love to be a fly on the wall inside that space vehicle. <laughs> There's so many things you need to consider. Certainly physical fitness, just overall health of the person. You know, are there underlying comorbidities or conditions that you need to mitigate? But one of the bigger things is, have they ever been in an extreme environment before? Have they ever experienced a launch, G-forces? Um, these are things that you don't want someone to have to experience the first time on the real day. So a lot of it is training with the system itself and the vehicle in case something goes wrong. A lot of it is just putting somebody, like I mentioned, in that uncomfortable environment so they're not surprised and they don't panic. Behavioral is huge for missions like these. Anybody can do 12 minutes. The Inspiration 4 crew trained a while. They did a bunch of stuff. They climbed Mount Rainier. They did a lot of things together. They did the training that needed to be done. And that was just for four days. Now think about a month, two months, three, four, five, six. It is a marathon that you're running. And if you don't learn how to manage fatigue well, manage your timeline, I actually performed meditation on orbit on days that were very stressful. It's very important, I think. Other crew members handled it differently. You have to think about these things. So it's not that I worry. I think the commercial space flight industry is going to push ahead, but I would love to be a fly on the wall, floating fly for some of those missions. So thank you for asking that. Thank you. Hi, I, I have a question. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking to all of us. This was absolutely fascinating. Uh, a lot of us are medical students or probably residents as well. And we're all in the stage of our training where we're selecting different opportunities to pursue and to get excited about. And you spoke about how so many people space, uh, have lots of different backgrounds and experiences that they bring to the table. Uh, we're kind of in the stage of selecting what those things are. So your background is in this electrical engineering as well as medicine and aerospace. And what are some things that we could look into or get excited about that might be relevant to future space travel or space missions? Yeah, so I always tell people, because I have a lot of, especially medical students come up to me or undergrad and say, hey, what, what type of engineering should I do? What type of science should I do? What type of medicine should I do? What is NASA like? And I always tell them, you do exactly what you want to do. Um, we have all backgrounds at NASA. I would never pick a career or go down a path that I didn't enjoy, that I wouldn't want to do the rest of my life. So for me, I love internal medicine. I absolutely love it. And if NASA dissolved tomorrow, I would be absolutely happy doing exactly what I am right now with internal medicine. For others, that's being a surgeon, OBGYN, psychiatry, research. Honestly, when it comes down to it, if you're thinking about applying for the astronaut corps or working for NASA, just do what you do really, really well. Be a good team player. And that sounds really stupid and simple, but that is what it comes down to most of the time. Um, and that's why I talked about the expeditionary behavior a lot of times, because in any big organization, if you talk with your managers or your department heads or your faculty that you know, you deal with on a daily basis. One of the hardest things we do in our profession, one of the most difficult problems we'll ever deal with, it usually revolves around people's behavior. And so it's, it's just one of the um, more difficult parts. And, and you know, that being a physician, especially, 
you're trying to develop your own bedside manner and you were trying to develop who you are as a professional, as a physician, as a human being. And so I, you know, the more passionate you are about your work and you love what you do, um, that, that is really the best course. Try and stay involved though, too. I mean, being part of the space medicine group there at UCSD, there's an aerospace medicine conference held annually. This year it's in Reno in May. If you get the chance to go, if you can get that time off, you will meet everybody you need to meet during that conference. It's such a small, such a small conference. And so, so you know, it's just such a small family. It's actually really awesome. So Besides that, there are, you know, come visit us at UTMB. I think there are going to be others, a program at Mayo Clinic as well. Come to Johnson Space Center. Do the clerkship either as a student or a resident. That's held twice a year. It's a fantastic clerkship if you get a chance. So there's so many opportunities out there, um, even to rotate at SpaceX as well. They have student and resident opportunities. Take advantage of them. My lamp broke as we were talking. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. My dog is, is he's, she's starting to bark at things out the window. So <laughs> thank you so much. Sure. You hi. That was a My name answer. is, oh, hi. Oh, no, no. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Scarlett. Sorry. Hi, um, my name is Scarlett. Thank you so much for this talk. I know you're very busy. Um, I have a question. Um, what advice would you give a Hispanic female trying um, or looking into aerospace medicine or becoming an astronaut? So advice I'd give any women, because I, I, do, I do try to mentor a lot of women in the field of medicine and in the field of aerospace medicine specifically is to take advantage of opportunities, even if you think you're not qualified for them. A lot of women will not even consider applying for a position or especially one in leadership or maybe whether it's in the medical school, whether it's in your residency, in the department, maybe being chief resident, they won't even think about it because they figure they need to be way overqualified before they're even basically qualified to fit up, to fill that role. And if, if I could have talked to a younger me 10 or 15 years ago, I would have told myself not to be so anxious about being ready. You're ready. You will make yourself ready. So go ahead and go for it. I would have been a lot more brazen. And people are like, you're brazen. You just launched on a rocket. Yeah, I'm also, you know, 45 years old now at this point. But when I was in my mid 20s, my late 20s, my early 30s, going through medical school and residency, it was a little different. So you know, it's, it's, I think women, again, we tend to hold ourselves back and not apply for those leadership positions. You need to apply. You are good enough. Thank you. Hello. You talk about having uh, a lot of cross training in different areas. What was the most difficult for you um, in, in those areas? Yeah, I think honestly, one of the more difficult training events was probably the neutral buoyancy lab operating in that suit for six hours. Um, it's like running a marathon and you only get about 20 ounces of water. Uh, so we have a little water bag that's kind of attached. It's Velcroed right to the inside of the suit to where the little straw comes up and it sits kind of rubbing on your chin the whole time too. It's annoying. Um, but it, it is the ultimate test of patience and endurance in that suit, because a suit again is not made for humans to move. You're not completely flexible where you can move your arms and elbows. You're very, you feel like T-Rex where you have very short arms and your legs serve no purpose. And so they'll ask you to do basic tasks, remove boxes, drill, bolt in things. And you're going to get to the work site and be like, man, I can't reach anything. I can't pull anything out. And it's, you can get frustrated so quickly. So it really taught me how to just sit and be patient, think about things, even when it hurt. And that suit hurts, especially towards the end. Um, and again, you have to, you can't move too quick because if you overheat, you will never catch back up and you won't do well. So that, I think, working in the spacesuits is probably very challenging for most people. For others, it was robotics. For others, it was learning the Russian language, which isn't easy at our age. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question. Oh, no, what do you think? 
Um, hold on, sorry. All right, uh, my name is Sammy, uh, and thanks so much for your talk. My question is about the experience of zero gravity for uh, extended periods of time, because I think I have a glorified idea that it seems super fun all the time. And then after watching you struggle with the ultrasound, it hit me that it might just not be. So uh, does zero gravity ever get old or even, I guess, annoying after a period of time? And uh, do you prefer zero gravity or uh, gravity here on earth? Oh my God, it never gets old. Never gets old. It can be annoying because I lost my fork multiple times. I lost my pencil. I lost my spoon. I've, we lost science on orbit. Science. We were searching for two test tubes for about a week before we found it. Because imagine the PI panicking on the ground. This is something I've been working on for years. But to be eating dinner and just you're floating in an upright position, right? Everybody eats upright. And then to just flip over backwards and be upside down with no effort and then flip back right side up. It never gets old. I got, uh, you miss sitting, you miss sitting on your butt. <laughs> you miss feeling the ground beneath your feet. So it's not that microgravity got old and that you got tired of it. Living on board the station, you began to miss earth because you couldn't smell earth and you couldn't smell a rainy day and you couldn't smell snow and you couldn't feel the cold and listen to the birds or look at a sunrise. So I, even today, when I stand on my back patio, I enjoy things so much more with all my senses now than I did before. I have a much deeper appreciation but man, floating around never gets old. I have a question. It's kind of more logistical, um, but you talked about how you have to consider bringing supplies up, but what happens when those supplies, like medical supplies expire and what do you do with them? Yeah, so we ran into that issue where we had medication that had expired. Um, and luckily the space program has gotten robust enough to where we have cargo vehicles launching to ISS almost every two to three weeks. So if you need to have a Walgreens run, you kind of can, you know, with medication. We didn't used to be that way. Um, we tend to be very um, proactive with resupply. We don't wait to the last second, but kind of like most pharmaceuticals, even though the expiration date says July of 2021, it's probably still good on July 15th, probably still good in August too, right? So if we had to, you know, we're not pulling pharmaceuticals or you know, medications out that often where we need to use them, but we could. And we have so many partners, international partners that also launch cargo vehicles. The Russians are launching a progress cargo vehicle every two to four weeks. The Japanese have a very robust cargo vehicle system. Northrop Grumman launches the Cygnus. And of course, SpaceX launches their Dragon. Plus you have your crewed vehicles, which can serve as cargo vehicles if you really need to get something up there. So we kind of take for granted how good we've gotten in low Earth orbit at bringing up these cargo vehicles. We capture them with the arm and we dock them and unload them. And then they undock like a big old bus leaving the parking lot. To me, that was one of the most amazing things out there. Thank you. Uh, Sarita, one quick question here. Uh, this is Bhavesh. Uh, thank you again for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, just with the research mindset that I have uh, curiosity uh, that when you are getting trained uh, for taking up the flight uh, for a long period of time using simulators, and you also mentioned some of the uh, medical issues that you face when you are in space, do you think that you can create some kind of environment up, uh, when while you are in the space? Uh, so as to simulate the same, not the zero gravity, but you know what you would have when you come back to minimize a lot of these things. Because again, when you're trying to simulate something here before you take up your flight in space, the same thing if you can do it there, a lot of things can be minimized from medical perspective and also may provide some uh, future perspective. Uh, for, you know, new inventions. Yeah, if you've gotten any, any ideas, I'll take them. Um, 
Now, in all seriousness, though, yeah, people, we, scientists, um, researchers think about that all the time. So one of the, you know, I mentioned neurovestibular. I mentioned that as being one of our biggest issues. We've talked about using virtual reality type programs on orbit to sort of begin to retrain our brain before coming back down. People have talked about using artificial gravity on orbit for, I mean, think about it. Arthur C. Clarke wrote about a spinning space station, right? But in order to create something like that, the moment arm would have to just be huge. Um, so I think artificial gravity might be something we could use in the future. It's just, again, how much size do you have? How much space, how much mass and volume? So I think more along the lines, virtual reality, we have had, you know, we've had the Oculus up there. Um, what else could we do to help minimize those impacts before landing? That's part of the reason we work out two and a half hours a day, every day, is to minimize the cardiovascular, the bone, the musculoskeletal, those impacts. Um, but we still have a long ways to go and we just haven't gotten very far when it comes to the neurovestibular realm. Plus, Human physiology is so beautifully complex, it varies from individual to individual. And so some folks have no issues, some folks have huge issues. And we can't predict who will have an issue with the DVT, who won't, who will have the spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome where they become more presbyopic up on orbit and maybe even begin to lose part of their visual field. We can't predict who will have that and who won't. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a scientific conundrum. There's plenty of research to be done if anybody's interested. Quick question. Hi. Does oh. the presbyopia resolve? Um, so some people have a permanent diopter shift after landing. We've seen that in a few crew members. Uh, I never had any issue with it. I didn't notice anything. We do tend to see it in, in males over the age of 50. And it could be that just because as you, as you age and become more presbyopic, you lose that ability to accommodate more so. And the younger you are, you know, maybe you're able to accommodate for that on orbit. So we have seen some permanent diopter shifts though on landing with some crew. Hello. I have a quick question. Thank you so much for the talk and everything and allowing us to record the talk. I have two questions. One is, um, what was your greatest fear before you went to space? And most importantly, your greatest fear now that you came back and now that years have passed, what's your greatest fear now? And the second one is, are you able to watch Netflix when you're up in space? Is that possible to catch up on your favorite show? I'll start with the last question first. No, unfortunately, sadly, this is going to make you guys, you're just going to take a big gasp. We really just got the ability to surf the internet when I was up there in June, July of 2018. And we we're very bandwidth limited. So streaming was difficult. We could do it. Most of us would stream sporting events and things like that, you know, college football, stuff like that. But you couldn't just watch. Nobody could sit around and just stream Netflix. We could watch movies, but we'd have to have the ground upload it for us. And we had a whole big library on ISS that we could use. But every Saturday night, it was movie night for the crew. And so we'd always have a movie picked. Everybody got a turn, pick a movie. And they'd upload that, and then we'd all watch it together. Greatest fear before launching is, oh, my gosh, I hope I can do my job and do it well. Right? You are serving your country. You represent a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people are looking towards you, and you want to make sure that you complete the mission. And so you, you, you know, gotten so much experience by that point and talked to as many people as you could talk to and learn about what they would do or wouldn't do again. And so you've got as much of an arsenal, you know, and I guess the other fear is what is it going to be like going to the bathroom? Let's be honest, right? It's always terrifying. Every crew member, it is always terrifying when you get up there because it's just without gravity it's more difficult. And once you get through that, you're okay. Um, I never thought about this last part of your question, which is greatest fear now. I think for me, what I'd love to see is ISS continue as long as possible. It's a beautiful science. It is an ISS national lab. We have more scientific capability than we've ever had before. 60 to 80% of what we do on orbit is science. And of the life science research, which is a huge portion of what we do, 80% of that life science research 
is to benefit life on Earth. It has nothing to do with sending astronauts to Mars. It has nothing to do with keeping us healthy on station. It's looking at Alzheimer's. It's looking at Parkinson's disease. It's looking at cancer. It's looking at muscle atrophy in a bed rested population. It's looking at every organ system because there's so few plate, there's really only one place off the earth where you can take away that gravity vector. And the number of experiments we performed up there, I looked at antimicrobial gels and how that antibiotic migrated through the gel in the absence of gravity, protein crystal growth experiments. It was really unbelievable. We looked at human and bovine sperm and how radiation impacts that and sperm mobility. It was amazing. So, and again, I didn't learn about most of this until after I got up on orbit. Thank you so much. Hi, I have a question. Um, what, from both a logistic and an emotional standpoint, what was it like leaving internal medicine to do your training and then trying to integrate back in those transitions? And you said that you were away from home like 60% of the time. The other 40%, were you still practicing or um, was that you were just leaving medicine for long periods of time and then coming back? I figured if I was going to give a talk to a bunch of medical professionals, that would be a question I get. I usually don't get that question from the audience because they don't understand like you folks understand. So thank you for asking that. It was really hard for me. Um, I love being an internist. I love inpatient hospital medicine. I do outpatient as well, but I love being on the wards. So it was very difficult for me. The really 10 to 12 years where NASA was the majority of my job. Now it's a much smaller part not being able to practice the way I wanted to. I really missed it. I missed patient interaction. I missed patient contact. I missed feeling like I was making a difference. Because at NASA, you make a difference. It's just in a different way. In medicine, it's almost an immediate impact. And not every day is that way, right? I mean, you all know that. There, you have good days and you have bad days. So the way I was able to keep up with that, and so I did continue to practice the entire time I was in the core more actively. A lot of our astronaut physicians do not. I think I was, I think the only one practicing for a while. And then maybe there's a couple of us. Um, I kept up my credentialing with the universities. I practiced in after hours student run free clinics. UTMB has a big one. I practiced, I did a lot of urgent care on the weekends and after hours. So the time I was home, a lot of that time was taken away because my husband understood how important it was for me to still be a physician. That was still so important to me to save patients. And I would have to do those hours, you know, again, after hours and on weekends to kind of keep up my skills as much as I could. I would cover for another faculty on the weekend on the wards if I could, just to keep that experience up. But it was hard and it definitely took away more time from family. And so that's why when I landed, I made the decision that I needed academic medicine to be a greater percentage of what I did. And NASA got it. They said, no problem. You still work for us. No problem. Do what you want to do. That's why I work with a lot of students and residents now. And I forgot how tiring the words were, <laughs> especially during COVID. Thank you so much. Going back to your answer to Sammy's question, um, you had talked about sleeping and how your Velcro to the side. How hard is it to fall asleep without that feeling of being horizontal? Yeah, so I had to, um, you know, we sleep in a little phone booth. And what I had to do to feel like I was kind of sleeping on earth is I would lodge my head on one side of the wall and stick my feet out and push my feet into a corner to where I still had some contact. I couldn't sleep free floating. It was too difficult. I had to have something pushed up against there. Um, for me to feel like I was kind of on earth. Because the one thing you never get in space. So when you're on earth and you've had a long day and you've been on your feet for 14 hours and you lie down, whether it's on a sofa or a bed and you just get that, uh, where all your muscles relax, that doesn't ever happen up there. And it's really hard to explain. So up there, you just, you, and you learn, your body learns how to sleep. And I slept really well on orbit because we have very soundproof rooms. It's quiet. There's no animals. There's no spouse. <laughs> there's no cell phone. It's a soundproof room. It's dark. 
perfect temperature control. You have to have adequate ventilation because you do worry about CO2 buildup and CO2 bubbles in front of your face. But man, I slept like a baby up there. Better than I ever do down here. I had a relating uh, question. Um, is there a uh, jet lag in space? And if so, how did you sort of adapt to that? We didn't really have jet lag. Um, by the time we launched um, Moscow time, you know, the space station runs on Greenwich Mean Time, and Moscow time is only about three hours separated. So I, we never really experienced it. We tried not to circadian shift the crew, if at all possible. Sometimes the, we'd have to stay up late for a, a cargo vehicle to dock, but we really try to minimize the impact of sleep and fatigue. Because let me tell you, when you're running a six month mission and you're working almost every day, if you begin to tire out the crew, for, you know, productivity, efficiency plummets, people get cranky. We usually try to take weekends off. They're never really off. You're still cleaning. You're still doing things. A few times we had to work through a weekend. And I will tell you, come Monday, when you don't have a weekend off, it doesn't matter if you're doing the coolest thing in the world. You're not happy. You're grumpy. So um, we paid attention to sleep and fatigue a lot during the mission. Awesome. Thank you. We'll take um, two more questions. If that's okay with you. Okay, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, so just a quick follow up on what you previously said. Are you allowed to have like, I don't know, like coffee or like caffeinated stuff? Um, oh, yeah. Know? Okay. Oh yeah, it's it's a horrible day if we start to run low on coffee on space station. So we actually get our own um, we get our own personalized drink containers sent up with beverages of choice. You know, not everybody likes coffee. Some like tea. Some don't want anything hot. You can get almost anything instant that you just have to add hot water to. So I actually had Starbucks via coffee, and you can add however much cream or sugar or whatever you want. They will make those bags up for you and send that up there. And then they also have kind of ISS standard coffee. It's like a Kona coffee. We also had cappuccinos that you could just add hot water to. Those are really good. Um, so yeah, there's if there's no coffee on orbit, <laughs> it's, it's a bad day. Everybody loves coffee. So, uh, quick question: You mentioned learning uh, languages and potentially Russian, is is it a pretty international multilingual space on the space station? Or are there a lot of languages floating around? How does that work? You, you muted. I think you're still muted. You're muted, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Your, your mic is on mute. Sorry, I don't know if you caught any of that. Um, I'll start again. So we, um, the official language is English on board the ISS, but you, you have a mix of, of languages. We often call it a Wranglish, where it'd be a mixture of Russian and English, where I would talk to my cosmonaut friends in Russian and they'd respond to me in English. Um, Alex would speak to us in German every now and then, but none of us really understood. So cosmonauts are very well trained in English and we are pretty well, um, first in Russian as well. And it just depends on which mission control you're talking to. Um, but for the majority, a lot of the time, all the operations are in English, except for launch and landing. You know, it's a Russian vehicle. There is no English. So you are running everything in Russian at that point. Thank you so much. And we just wanted one, we had one last question from our board member, Tim. Sure. Hi, just one quick question. I was wondering um, when you were on board, um, did you perform any medicine or did you have, was there any like any urgent uh, procedures that you had to uh, perform with your team members? No urgent procedures. I did a little, not even really suturing. Someone had a small, very superficial kind of laceration. So I was stunned to learn we did not have steri strips. I thought for sure of the, all the lightweight pieces of equipment you can have in a kit and they weren't there. So I just made steri strips out of tape, right? That's all it is. Um, you give intramuscular injections of Phenergan all the time. Usually the first couple of days when people get up with space adaptation syndrome, they get a nice shot in the butt of Phenergan as they go to sleep. Other than that, we had a few burns from scalding water, musculoskeletal pains, aches and strains, especially low back strain, 
from using our, our weightlifting equipment. Um, other than that, knock on wood, you really don't have a lot of trauma. You don't have the need where you're doing emergent procedures up there. Now, luckily, we've been lucky through many years of space flight where we haven't needed that. Statistics and time says you might at some point, but it definitely doesn't dominate anything that we do. Wow, that was a great talk. I really liked her um, presentation and everything that she said. It was really fun knowing that, you know, um, things can fool around, even Tabasco could go inside your ear. Um, and, but it was also very surprising how like the water can just stick on you and then burn you and it will keep on doing so until you wipe it off. Space is very tricky. Yeah, I mean, Scarlett, this was really interesting. I really liked her analogy of comparing internal medicine and aerospace medicine, how internal medicine, it's abnormal body, normal condition, but aerospace is normal body in an abnormal condition. And like probably like three or four months ago, there were like news is like all over the place of Jeff Bezos going to space or Virgin Galactics going to space. And just like seeing how there are more schools incorporating this and like for the Zoom, there were like a ton of people there with like variety of backgrounds, just makes me wonder like how this will expand in the future. And I really thought that NASA was something so far away from my Korean background because there's only one Korean astronaut in the whole world. And I also really like the part where she says self, not only self care, but team care is important because like space is a really hard environment. And just the fact that they have to take care of each other when they're like confined in this small, they say it's pretty big, but I still feel like it's a five story bedroom size, not five story, sorry, five, five room, but still it's a small place. And then the thing is you can't escape there. Like even though you might feel depressed or you might want to leave space, you cannot for a designated time because it, I think what she said was it's a billion dollar project to get somebody out. Yeah. So that was really interesting. And I think the most important thing that I took away from the talk is how she emphasized the importance of training where they like train when there's like a fire going on or they like, you know, do a marathon in the desert that kind of really like Spartan or really weird training. You can say is really helping them prepare for the real life. Now, I thought about that to myself or like to the listeners out there, because I think that's why we want to have somebody with such a diverse background or the people who can demonstrate their distance travel, because it's going to be their daily routine, how they juggle different things at the same time. It might be family issues. It might be schoolwork. It might be volunteering. It could be any other things, but just juggling these things will probably eventually help you in the future in navigating things and making really nice decisions at the time. So that's what I, what I think I got from her is that it's really important to have people who are experienced and probably our struggles and difficulties will probably be an asset. Yeah, I really like how um, she talked about how they all work as a team and since they all have come from different areas and backgrounds with different skills, they can work together and draw on their strengths and weaknesses and um, work together as a family. Um, and uh, just, I was a bit disappointed um, when uh, I asked a question about um, being Hispanic and what advice would she give? Um, I really like how she uh, said that this is an advice for all women. I was just kind of hoping to get a little bit of perspective on, you know, her being um, Hispanic and if there were any barriers or any advice for breaking those barriers for people like me who come from a Latinx background. Um, and, but uh, it is true that a lot of women don't apply for jobs and that they feel that they're not adequate enough and we should be able to apply to those jobs. Um, and we should just get past um, astounding ourselves and just apply 
Um, and I feel like that's mainly the struggle that we just don't apply enough. And there was actually a research study um, confirming this. Um, so I guess the guys get the jobs because they're the ones applying, right? <laughs> uh, but in all in all, in all um, I am happy for her, um, for her willingness and determination and just her courage to be able to be in the field that she is and um, as a person who is also working on um, uh, research and helping, you know, to be able to combat this fight against cancer. Uh, I really appreciate all her work and her time. And honestly, I really, really enjoyed um, everything that she shared with us. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Like, but in real life, it's so hard to separate the two issues, even though we ask her a background of being like Latinx women, but in real life, it's not clear cut. You cannot be one thing or the un- another. And it's really tempting to focus on just one issue, but unfortunately minority, min- minority concerns are real. And I believe people should be acknowledging it to help empower fellow community members who might look for mentors to look up to. Yeah, coming from a Latino background, I just wish that she would have gone a bit more in depth about her journey, maybe her struggles. Um, You know, usually people try to relate something, um, have something to relate with uh, their mentor or someone that they really look up to, um, just so that we can see that we can too, (laughs) you know. Um, and because, uh, being Hispanic is, is part of my identity and I feel that, um, you know, seeing another, um, Hispanic being at the top of the hill, you know, at this level of like awesomeness, um, that's very inspiring. And, um, but nonetheless, you know, uh, is really, really appreciated, um, her advice. And I really love how as a woman in general, um, she really tries to, um, tries to support other women and encourage them to apply and, you know, be part of space too. You know, a lot of people usually say that's not the norm. So I'm glad that she broke that norm and, um, hopefully more of us women can follow. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of the previous talk we did with our fellow fellow board members. And there was a movie called Hidden Figures. It was about NASA female engineers. And I'm pretty sure things have changed. There will be more representation of women. But I think it's really important that people should not be afraid and be confident and apply. And looks like Scarlett, you can't be the next beacon, you know, any plans on going up to space to, you know, give a similar talk like this? Well, for right now, no, unless Elon Musk out of the blue emails me and invites me (laughs) to go to space. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) cool, cool. But that's it for now. Thank you all for listening to us and catch you on the next episode. Hearing Her Voice is brought to you by Women's March San Diego at UCSD. The podcast is written and produced by Scarly Lopez and Jin Ho Jung. Our design director is Melissa Wang. Our creative director is Surin Sunsa. And our technical director is Catherine Cordova. To learn more about Women's March San Diego at UCSD, please visit our website on Linktree. Subscribe to Hearing Her Voice on Anchor app or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you.